Hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. On today's video, we're going to be talking all about Yule and how you can celebrate it for yourself. <music> is probably the most famous and arguably one of the most popular sabbats within the Wheel of the Year. It's a very popular holiday that many Wiccans, Pagans and Witches will choose to celebrate, and you'll often find that variations of this sabbat are found within modern celebratory traditions. For those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, Yule is probably the most easy to celebrate, as it fits quite readily into other holiday celebrations, such as Christmas. Yule is one of the eight spokes within the holidays of the Wheel of the Year. This is a modern pagan adaptation on pre-existing holidays and festivities. It's important to remember, though, that Yule can mean a lot of things to different people. It is a much older festivity that has been added into the Wiccan Wheel of the Year much later. Today I'm going to be talking about Yule in several of its different modern aspects. We're going to be talking about Yule as a 12-day celebration that involves looking inwards, honouring the light in the darkest parts of the year, we're also going to be talking about it as a representation of midwinter, and also as the winter solstice. The winter solstice is the day where the nights are longest and the day is shortest, where in some regions the sun doesn't even go above the horizon. This is the midwinter point, where it is the darkest it's ever going to be, and from this point forwards it's only going to get lighter and brighter. Now technically these three things are different, but in modern celebrations they're usually encompassed all in one. I'm hoping that this list of celebrations will contain something that almost everyone is going to be able to do. Whether you are sharing your practice openly with other like-minded people and carrying out large group rituals, or whether you're planning on doing this entirely for yourself in the private of your own home or room, I'm hoping that there will be at least one thing in this list that everyone is going to be able to carry out. The one takeaway that you should get from this is that everyone is going to celebrate their Sabbath celebrations differently, and regardless of whether you do something really big or really small, your celebrations are just as valid as everyone else's. And with that being said, let's talk about some celebrations. Let's start with probably one of the most famous things that you can do at this time of year, and that is bringing in a Yule tree or a Christmas tree. Especially if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, this is going to be fairly easy for you to do, as Christmas trees are pretty commonplace at this time of year. This can be a real tree that is in a pot, it can be a tree that you have cut, it can also be a plastic tree of any shape or size. The main point here is that it's an evergreen tree. Now, evergreen is deeply symbolic. It connects to everlasting life, the idea that even in the darkest time of the year, life still lives on. And especially when you look outside and you see everything to be seemingly dead, that can be something that we need to remind ourselves of. And so many people will bring in a tree for this specific purpose. Now, if you don't have room for a tree, you don't have to do a full tree. You can have a wreath or just a tiny mini tree in the corner of your room, whatever works best for you. The goal here is to have that representation of that continuing life. If you like, you can also decorate that tree. Now, any standard Christmas decoration is pretty good for celebrating Yule because the colors often line up. Baubles, tinsel, and other decorative items can be added in the colours that represent Yule, these being red, green, black, white, gold, silver, brown. All of these colours are fairly popular, especially gold, silver, red, and green, as Christmas decorations. So you can add those to the tree, to the wreath, or to anything else in your home to bring in that Yule energy. Now, some people will decorate their trees specifically with things that represent the Yule season, such as dried greenery and sliced oranges. Dried, of course, you don't want to put fresh oranges on your tree, that's going to start going bad really quickly. Other people will make their own decorations out of salt dough, but really, any decorations that you like are going to work for this. My own tree is a bit of a mix match of different things. It contains the blues and the whites that represent the cold and the dark and the icy, but it also has clay goddess figures fake antlers, representations of deers and other animals that I connect with. It also contains several strangely coloured bejeweled beetle decorations and other such oddities. It's all a bit of a hodgepodge of Christmas decorations and Yule decorations, and that's typically the nice balance that I get. I like having a bit of both because, after all, Christmas is what I celebrated as a child, 
and I will still celebrate it today, just without any of the religious connotations that go behind it. Decorating is something that's really common at this time of year, and you can take it beyond a tree. If you're in an area where you don't typically have Christmas trees, or you don't want a Christmas tree, you can simply decorate for the Sabbath season. This can include using the colours I mentioned earlier in other decorations, whether that is artwork, or simply pieces and items that you lay around your home. As long as you connect it to the Yule season, that's the most important. You don't necessarily even have to use evergreens. There are many other plants that are connected with this season, and for good reason. The holly is commonly used. It has a deep connection with the afterlife, with everlasting life, and with the Yule time season, and you'll often find that in modern Christmas decorations. Mistletoe was another good option. Commonly harvested around this time of year, it's a plant that lives a strange life. A parasite commonly found on oak trees, it was often harvested and used for protection for the year to come, which is why it's so famous in Christmas celebrations today, but people will use it to kiss under instead of for protecting their home. You can use fake mistletoe, holly, ivy, or evergreen plants, or you can use the real thing, but please be incredibly careful, especially with mistletoe as it's incredibly toxic if you do ingest it. So just bear that in mind, please always stay safe. You all knew this was coming, but you can also set up a Sabbath altar, something that I do every single Sabbath, pretty much unless I completely forget that a Sabbath exists, which I'll be honest, I kind of do. There are some Sabbaths that I just don't vibe with, and I don't really celebrate that much, but Yule is not one of them. I will always set up a Yule altar. My altar contains a lot of items that I personally connect with the Yule season. This includes figures of horned gods, which represent the wild hunt at this time of year, but also paintings that I have created that represent the Yule time season, and more specifically, the winter solstice, as well as crystals and other items that I resonate with. I'm gonna fit me setting up my Yule altar in really briefly here, and hopefully that will give you some inspiration for your own Yule altar. This time of year isn't just about decorating your home though. There's plenty of things that you can do that involve looking inwards. This can include practicing your energy sensing, energy manipulation, centering, grounding. These things are all really useful to practice, especially when many people practice less ritually in the winter than they do in the summer. It's a good time to start journaling, to start a dream journal or divination diary. It's a great time to start a book of shadows where you can note down the things that you've practiced in the previous year. And if you've already got all of these items, it's a good time to go through them. Now, this doesn't mean going through them critically, picking yourself apart. It means take a look at the things that you noted down, see how far you've come. If it's a book of shadows, see the progress that you've made within your magical practice. Note down which spells and rituals worked and which ones didn't, what you would change and what you would keep the same. If you have a dream journal or a divination diary, look into the kind of dreams that you were experiencing. Did any of them turn out to be prophetic or have symbolism in them that was significant later on? Did your divination readings come true weeks or months after the event? These are really good to show the progress in your magical practice. 
but it's really important not to be hypercritical. This is meant to be a fun experience. It's not meant to be a teacher looking at your work and judging it. So just remember that if you're going to do this. You can also carry out some Sabbath divination. This is something that I would typically recommend at every single Sabbath. And if you don't do divination at any other time in the year, this is a really good way to do it. Sabbath divination allows us to perceive the potential future within this Sabbath season. So between now till Imbolg, which is the next Sabbath celebration. It allows us to break our year down, so rather than doing one reading for the entire year, you're doing one reading per Sabbath. Now you can do this through many different means, from dream divination to tarot, oracle, runes, pendulums, tassiomancy, bibliomancy, anything that you like, that you connect with, you can use at this time of year. A form of divination that's more specific to this time of year, however, are omen days. Now this is something that has really fascinated me now ever since I learned about it, and it's something that you can really only do at this time of year. The idea is that the 12 days after Christmas Eve represent each of the 12 months of the year. So on December 25th, that represents January, December 26th is February, 27th is March, and so on and so on. By doing divination on each of these omen days, or by perceiving the world around you and making judgments based on the things you're seeing, the emotions you're feeling, what you're expressing, and writing it down, it was believed that you could tell your fortunes for each month in the year to come. Now this might sound scary, but as with all forms of divination, it's only going to show you the things that may happen if nothing changes. Any little change that you make in your life has the potential to change the outcome of any reading that you do, which is why many divination readers will do readings every week or every few weeks, because any decision that we make has the potential to change the last reading that we did. Around this time of year, parties are really commonplace, and if you do have a coven, group, or a collection of like-minded people, even if that's your family, you can sit down and do a divination party. This is where everyone gathers together, enjoys good food and drink, that could just be hot chocolates, that could be alcohol-free cider, that could be tea, coffee, or mulled wine, whatever it is that you enjoy at this time of year. And then at the stroke of midnight, everyone does a divination reading. This is done in complete silence and it remains silent until everyone is finished with that reading. You would then write it all down and collectively discuss what it is that you got from that reading. You might find, especially if these people are your relatives, your friends or close common members, that some of your readings might overlap really closely, and that might give you more of an insight as to who else is going to be a part of your reading. If two people within that group have nearly the exact reading, it could mean that those readings are connected together. By doing divination like this in group environments, whether that's a coven or simply a bunch of friends, it can often allow us to see deeper meanings in that reading, especially if other people are letting you know what they would get out of that reading if they were to have done it for themselves. Along the theme of celebrating with a group, it's also a great time to gather beside the fireplace, whether that is a fake fire, whether that is a radiator, or whether that is a traditional open fireplace, and tell some stories. Mythology and legend was very traditionally oral. It was something that was passed down through spoken word. And so it's a good time to reminisce on that. Dim all of the light, sit around a fire, use candlelight to see, and tell mythological and fantastical stories. These could be stories that you have been told, that you have read, that you have found out, or it could be stories that you've made up on the spot. You can do this with a coven and it's really wonderful to do around a fireplace or a fire pit type environment. Or you can do this with your family and it's especially enjoyable if you're doing this with small children who are going to see more awe in this experience than maybe other adults would. If you're celebrating your Yule alone, that doesn't mean that you can't experience this storytelling aspect. Look up some stories of gods, of landscapes, of spirits that occur during the Yule season and simply enjoy reading them yourself. These stories often contain an ounce of truth. And it's really lovely to be able to look back at the history that we have stored within these folk stories. If myths and legends aren't your thing, however, it can be a good time to slow down your practice and simply do research. This time of year is often considered a time of rest. Everything around us is resting after all. The sap from the trees has descended, the plants have died back, animals are going into hibernation. It's a time for us to relax a little bit. And that often means not doing as many things within our magical practice as we maybe would be in the spring, summer, or even early autumn. Now is a good time to reflect on your practice 
and figure out what you want to learn more about, what you want to develop your skills in. It's a time to sit on the sofa under a comfy blanket with a warm drink by the fire and do some reading and actually allowing ourselves to rest. The modern world doesn't seem to rest ever. And especially if you live in a busy city or a town, it can feel like you're go, go, go 24 seven. And that isn't healthy. It can lead to a lot of issues, a lot of it caused by burnout. And so it's really good to take the time to rest and relax. Resting isn't wasted time. This is something I'm trying really hard to learn. I am very much a go, go, go. I need to be doing everything 24 seven kind of a person. And if I'm not doing something, I feel really guilty about it and I don't let myself relax. So this is one overthinker, not very good at relaxing person, telling you that you need to relax. Even if you have to allot time in your schedule to be able to relax, do it. Because you're going to be so much better off for it in the new year when things start growing again and coming back to life again, you're gonna have far more energy so that you can do the same. This is a time of year where giving gifts is commonplace and it feels really good to give someone else something that they really enjoy. Now, giving gifts doesn't just have to be to people, it can also be to nature as well. Give gifts among common members, friends or family. It doesn't have to be things that are really expensive. Most people would very much appreciate something that's simply well thought out. Even if it's something handmade, if it's something that shows that you care about someone, that you're listening to them, that's usually far more meaningful than something that's really expensive. Obviously everyone's different, but I know for a fact that I would rather get something really small and handmade that shows that someone cares than something really massive that is not really anything related to my interests. You can do a secret Santa among your coven members, which is essentially where everyone picks a name out of a hat and you only buy a gift for the person whose name you have. It's really useful, especially during hard times like we're in right now, to be able to not have to spend too much money, but everyone is getting and receiving something. It's not only people though that deserve gifts at this time of year, but also nature. It's a time to be giving food to birds and to other animals that might be struggling, especially if you're in a city or a busy environment where there aren't that many trees or plants that are gonna give berries, birds can really start struggling. So if you have a garden, a balcony, a small outdoor space, it can be a good time to leave some water out and also leave out some food for the birds and other animals that you might want to take care of. Depending on what's happening this season, you might find that hedgehog hibernation isn't quite right. And so you might find that there are hedgehogs wandering around in the cold looking for food because they don't have enough food to be able to go into hibernation safely. So even something small that you can leave out is better than nothing. If you are gonna leave out water though, make sure that you change it frequently. If it freezes, try to put fresh stuff out so that there's always some fresh water that they can drink. But obviously, depending on your location, that might be really tricky. I know that in some places in the world, you take a glass of water outside and it will immediately freeze. Whereas here in England, that usually isn't gonna happen till it goes dark at night. So we do have the daytime where animals can come and get a drink and bathe themselves if they like. Typically during this midwinter time, people would be staying inside. They'd be trying to stay warm. Their houses would be lit by candlelight. They would be going to bed early and getting up later so that they didn't use too much of their fuel. They would often be limiting their food, knowing that they would have to make it through to the springtime without running out. Today, many of us have luxuries that people in the past wouldn't have even dreamed of. And so today we might see the things that we celebrate as being outdated, but in reality, it's a remembrance of the struggles and the difficulties that people had. During this time of year, the food would have been very different for people in the past and many people who live off the land today. You would have to eat seasonal food. You would also have to conserve or preserve food that you'd harvested in the summer and autumn in order to get you through this dark, cold time of year. If you'd like to experience this for yourself, I would recommend going and get some seasonal vegetables, even better if you've grown it yourself or they're from a local grower, and make food that is very seasonal to this time of year. It's also a good time to have a feast. Typically, this would be done around the winter solstice, as this is the tipping point. You've conserved your food thus far, and now you can see the end. And if you've been conserving your food, you will likely have put some aside to be able to have a midwinter feast. These feasts often involved friends and family, and it would allow us all to come together to bring different foods and different meals so that we could have one big celebratory meal to show that we've made it through the most difficult part of the winter. This is the darkest that it's ever going to be. 
from this point on, it's going to get lighter and brighter. It's going to be easier in some cases to survive because they could see the end of that darkness. We know that the days are getting lighter. It's going to get better. So you can do a Christmas or Yuletide feast, which is a common thing that people do during Christmas celebrations. After all, a Christmas dinner is essentially a Yule feast. You can see how everything kind of fits in together here, which is why Yule is one of the most popular celebrations to celebrate in the Northern Hemisphere, because it's probably the easiest celebration to slot in with more traditional modern celebrations. If you are planning on doing spell work and ritual around this time of year, there's a few things that could be good for you to do. Firstly, try and do a spell or ritual by candlelight alone. Experience that and then you'll truly be able to sink into this midwinter energy. You can also carry out bonfire rituals. Now, bonfire rituals surrounding Yule are commonly all about releasing the past and bringing in the future. Oftentimes, herbs and loose incenses are sprinkled into the fire as a way of imbuing the energy of the season. You may also want to write goals for the year to come on pieces of paper and throw it into the fire. You can do this singularly if you are using a cauldron fire. Just make sure that you're being safe and you have fire safety equipment. You can also do this with a large group of people if you are working in a group or coven, as mentioned, also have fire safety equipment. It's a great thing to do collectively, especially during the winter solstice eve. Some groups will also take this a little bit further. They will actually do a ritual that covers several hours over the midnight period. So on the eve of the winter solstice, they will be burning things that they want to remove from their life. And on the winter solstice day, or at least after midnight, they'll be burning things that they want to bring in with the coming sun. Other good rituals to do at this time of year are healing and protection workings, as well as anything that relates to the sun, because this is, if anything, a solar festival. It might not seem like it, but especially at the winter solstice, it is the coming back of the sun that's really the focal point. Anything for protection is also good to do at this time of year, and witches' balls are really commonplace. Witch balls do, in essence, look like Christmas baubles, and so there is a theory that maybe historic witch balls ultimately became Christmas baubles. Witch balls are often used to trap and contain unwanted spirits and energies. Originally, it was believed that they would trap or deter witches, but today witches have taken it, spun it on its head, and now it's a common part of magical practice. These can be used exactly like baubles on a tree, or you can hang them from windows, doors, or other liminal spaces as a way of attracting in that negative energy and absorbing it so it isn't in the rest of your home. These are typically created once a year around the Yule season, and then they are replaced or replenished the following year. It's a really good ritual to get into if that is something that you're interested in carrying out year after year after year. There are many different magical practices that you can add into your Yuletide celebrations that often have a little bit of a Yule spin on them. One such thing is to create gingerbread poppets. These are often created with groups or among the family, but you can do it yourself. Each person creates their own gingerbread figure that represents them. They will decorate it with colors and symbols that represent what they want to manifest in the coming year. And then when it's all ready, you eat it. And that's gotta be the best bit because you're eating all of that energy, that intention, what it is that you want to manifest and you are taking that into yourself. It's a fun thing to do with children. You can start getting them into witchcraft and paganism and generally it's just really good fun. Gingerbread can also be used in other rituals as well, including creating a gingerbread house. This is used as a representation of your own home. So you can add protection symbols onto the gingerbread house, have it in your home for the entirety of the Christmas or Yuletide season, and you end up with a little bit of extra house protection. And then at the end of it, you get to eat it. So you get to absorb all of that protection into yourself. What's better than that? To be fair though, if it has been sitting out for the entire season, you might not want to eat it, but that's a personal choice. You can also create garlands of herbs and flowers and dried fruits, which then allow you to imbue that energy into your home and into your space. There are just so many different options. You can also work with solar energies, solar gods, and also gods and goddesses of the season, as well as spirits, if that is something that you would like to do as well. There are just so many options. I'm really hoping that at least some of these are gonna be things you will want to put into your own magical practice. 
And lastly, something that many people have heard of, but maybe not so many people do, you can create a Yule log. Now this can be the traditional Yule log, which is typically a section of an evergreen tree that's dressed in foliage and has symbols carved into it that is typically stored from the year before, usually dressed in the ashes of the previous Yule log that is burned on the fire over the Yule period. Sometimes it's burned just over the night of the winter solstice. The idea being that if the log continues to burn evenly and steadily throughout the night, you will have a good new year to come or you can burn it gradually over the course of the Yule season. It really depends on what you feel comfortable with. At some point, you do have to start one, however, and so you don't necessarily have to dress it with the ashes from the previous Yule log if this is your first one. But once that Yule log is burned down, save the ashes. They're used for healing, for protection, for abundance. They're really good things that you can use for the entire year to come. And then in the following year, you can dress your new Yule log and burn another one. Thus, the ritual continues on and on and on and on. And over time, some of those ashes will actually compound onto one another because they not only have the previous year's ashes, but the one before and the one before and the one before, which can be really powerful. That being said, however, not everyone is going to have an open fire or a fireplace where they can do this. So if you would like to experience a Yule log for yourself, you can simply have one laid out on your altar or on a table as a representation or probably the tastiest option of them all, you can have one in cake form. Just stick some candles in it. It's basically a modern Yule log and you get to eat it. What's not to like? <laughs> so those are all of the things that I have for you today. I hope that you're gonna find at least something in this list that you can do for yourself. Do let me know if you're gonna do anything. Are you gonna set up an altar? Are you gonna do a ritual, a Yule log? What is it that you're gonna be doing? Let us all know in the comment section as it will help give even more ideas for other people as well. If you did like this video, please give it a like. It means a lot to me and it also tells YouTube that you enjoy this content. If you do have any questions, comments, concerns, video ideas, or just want to chit chat with the community, feel free to post it down in the comment section. If you do have a Yule altar that you would like to show other people, we do have a Discord server where you can post it. The link is in the description box. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel or in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. And with that being said, I hope you have a marvelous magical day. I hope you have a wonderful Yule and I will see you in the next video. Bye. Have you out any? Oh no. I have no idea where my audio cut off. Oh, that was so lucky, right? Okay, I looked up and I can see that my audio recorder has stopped recording and I have no idea at this point where it stopped, right? So I am like starting to freak out a little bit because like, oh my God, I don't want to film this entire video again. I've already been filming for an hour. I don't want to restart this again. And then I click to see where it cut off and it cut off about four seconds before I looked up at the screen. So it recorded everything except the last sentence that I said. Oh my goodness, thank you. Thank you, Bridget, for looking out for this one because I, I have limited time to film this. It's already going dark. I use the daylight, so I'm just gonna have to like power through. Oh. I really hope that was everything. Witches balls, bonfire, candlelight, giving food to birds, taking time, self-reflect, give gifts, have a feast, you'll alter, wear colours, tell stories, research. Oh, I didn't say pick up a new hobby. Ah, oh, damn. I'm not going back and filming it again. It'll end up in the bloopers. Pick up a new hobby. There you go. <laughs> An extra at ending edition. A Yule log. Oh, a Yule log. Shit. Okay, so I did have to redo a little bit. Um, Sabbath divination, decorate a tree. I can't believe I forgot to say about the Yule log. I was saving it till the end and then I just forgot to say it. So there you go, I've put it in now. <laughs> it wouldn't have been in if I hadn't looked through the list. So let's be glad that I did that. Okay, so now I have to figure out what on earth I'm going to do for a witchy gift guide. Hmm, let's see, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm.